Hey guys, it's Ben. So we um we had some technical difficulties with this episode, so that's why Aruna's not in it and why you're gonna miss the first question that we asked Jade, unfortunately. Um yeah, the audio is doing backflips. I don't really know how else to describe it. But other than that, it should be smooth sailing. Um so yeah, enjoy the episode. You still got four songs and a great, great interview. So big up Jade, big up Morgan the editor. Um yeah, roll the clip. All right, moving on. Your second song that you sent in was, ah, uh, yes. It was Jar Jar City by Capleton. When would you like to guess what this song was? I am saying this is a song that reminds you of your last production, and I only assume that because I'm feeling like it's got Nine Night vibes. Now, I've not seen Nine Night, but I'm kind of aware of the content. So that's, that's my assumption. Okay. I can tell you now that the correct answer is it's the song that describes how she got into theatre. Okay. Mm. Okay. See, now, I'm not listen- doing well here. I'm zero for two. <laughs> so I listened, I listened to this, this, uh, these songs this morning whilst I was making breakfast and stuff. And I listened to them and I was like, how did this get you into theatre? <laughs> Obviously, I was bopping. I was doing my thing. But I was like, where's the correlation? <laughs> So funny. So I, you gotta explain this to me, please. Cause, <laughs> cause I'm, I'm, I've been intrigued for the past a good like what three hours. That's this so is song, like, how did you do this? Um, so basically, it was a tricky question to answer. So I had to really okay. think about my approach. And um, mm-hmm. basically, I used to dance a lot. So when I was like okay. 15, 16, 17, mm-hmm. I was more dancing than doing drama. I did drama in school. Like, do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Did performance mm-hmm. studies in college. So it was like music. Mm-hmm drama and dance um but one of my friends I used to dance with she was like oh I go to this drama group like she come true I was like yeah yeah yeah, I come through and um I spent a good couple years there as a drama group called um Mayhem Theatre Company and a lot of them a lot of those people in that company or a good handful of those people are now my really really good friends anyway Mm -hmm. there was a guy part of the drama group called Ja yeah so we're getting there Mm-hmm. His name was Ja, yeah. And there was me and one of one of my other friends who's one of my really good friends now. We're both Jamaican. Mm-hmm. So like every week we used to call this guy call this guy Jaja City, innit? Mm-hmm. They'd be like, Oh Jaja City, Jaja So we used to always sing it whenever we <laughs> saw him. Ah, yeah, yeah, kind of it. it was kind of like our thing. Mm-hmm. Um and so what I really loved about it was that I was able to kind of express like my culture. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? And having these like really shorthands with like with my fellow creatives. I mean, you know, I was mm-hmm. like acting at the time, eh, whatever. But mm-hmm. um, you know, so yeah, it, that song really takes me back to that time when I really started to kind of understand drama, understand theatre, do shows. You know, we did a lot of shows at Southern Playhouse, and you know, we mm-hmm. were like young. Um, mm. so that was kind of like when I started kind of getting into theatre like as a like, oh okay. this could be a thing mm. and yeah that song kind of marks that time for me what was it do you think that kind of hooked you in that moment maybe like mm. oh, okay this is a thing for me like you've gone on to this drama group like was there something you're like yes I'm going to make this my life now or, <laughs> or just something that piqued that interest I just really enjoyed it you know I feel like it was just such a good vibe and also, we were a devised company, so whatever we did in the room would end up being on stage. And I was like, wow, like, that's incredible. It wasn't until I started doing directing courses when I was throwing the script, I was like, oh, wow, what, what, what's this? Mm-hmm. I've always mm-hmm. used to creating. Mm-hmm. And, and I feel like I just really enjoyed that process. And I was... Um, and it was so funny because um, Bolahan used to come and do sessions with us as well, but that's a whole other story. Yeah, yeah. so it was very interesting, like, growing up. And I'm like, Bolahan? And he's like, Jade? And I was like, okay, okay. <laughs> We've had many conversations about that group still. But, um, but yeah, so, yeah, so it was kind of like, I, like as well, because um, I wouldn't ever say, I never really liked, I didn't mind being on stage, but I'd rather dance mm. on stage than act. And that's still mm. to, to this day. So what I loved about it with the creative process is that I could put so much input in it, mm. but yet take the smallest character. Do you know what I mean? Because I wanted less lines. Mm. You know? 
So, so yeah, I think it was the process because um, it was so new, so different, so creative, so collaborative. All these things, obviously, I didn't mm. know that's what they were at the time. But mm. looking back, I was like, I love these elements, and I love, you know, our voices were heard. You know, yeah. Mm. How do you feel like? How do you feel like that that aspect of it, in terms of being able to play so much of your own culture and your own being into your into your productions? How do you feel like that's evolved as time has gone on within this industry? Mm. Like I, I, personally, and also sort of as a whole as well. I feel like it's. I always try and be true to myself Mm -hmm. um and and also I feel like because that was kind of like my foundation to Mm -hmm. be honest I thought that's what it was you know so then when the industry go oh Shakespeare oh Chekhov I'm like Mm -hmm. why (laughs) Mm -hmm. levels because I was never that was never my schooling that was never my thing I didn't Mm -hmm. study theatre studies like that um, in higher education, I studied history, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. you know, completely different. But um, but to me, very similar in ways, and and especially mm-hmm. in your approach. But like, I, I'm trying to think how to answer your question. So, me personally, yeah, I try and keep true to it because I feel like, um, especially like five years ago, we weren't as visible from a creative standpoint. And so I feel like it's integral. And I remember being in conversations where they're like, oh, just because you are who you are, mm-hmm. like, doesn't mean you have to tell black stories. And I remember mm-hmm. saying, so I'm supposed to let Lucy or Tom tell my story. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it should be like, oh, no, 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 that's what I'm saying. I'm like, no, no, no. But if I'm not telling it, who's telling it? Mm-hmm. So, so I feel like it is it is personal, but also you see now in the last couple of years, the industry are like calling that ish out, you mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. they're like saying, no, we have directors now. We have, you know, these theatre companies now, these actors, even sometimes actors are still getting whitewashed, stories are still getting whitewashed, mm-hmm. you know what I mean, mm-hmm. and casting. So people are calling it out, which I think is a very interesting conversation because from fellow directors I hear we should be able to tell any story that we want to tell and I'm like yeah I agree with that but then you go the other side is like but are there specific to stories that are only for other for certain people do you know what I mean mm. like, I feel yeah. like it's a constant conversation and personally I, I don't have the right answer to it but all I can do is be authentically myself mm. you know what I mean if, if I you know I've I was fortunate enough to take a show to Nigeria, for example, but like, and I told, you know, a story of Nigerian heritage and nobody was like, oh, why is Jay telling that story? Because there was elements of that story that was very much connected to me. And only, mm-hmm. do you know what I mean? And I understood mm-hmm. that. So, so I feel like it's very interesting and I'm not of Nigerian heritage direct like, like that. Do you know what I mean? So, mm-hmm. and even someone said that to me, well, I remember having this conversation with someone and I was like, yeah, but I directed this show and it's a Nigerian character. They're like, yeah, but Jade, but, but you get the world and you get this. I'm like, oh, okay. So there are, okay. Do you know what I mean? So I feel like there's still mm-hmm. a dialogue going around. Mm-hmm. I think it's so, much, a, I think it's so much about who is the best person to tell the story rather than whether yeah. or not they can or can't. 100%. Um, like, you might have someone that has an uh, entirely lived experience of exactly what the story is saying. And obviously that, that gives you an extensive amount of knowledge about what the thing is. But if they don't have the skill set or it's not, mm. there, there might be a specific element that the production requires that person just can't deliver. And they can't deliver that. And that makes them not the best person to tell that story. And it's all about the skill set and what, what you as an individual are bringing to the table for this project. I think it's the most important thing. Like when... I've worked with directors before where they're saying, oh, I'm not sure I should tell this story because it features a lot of, um, there's one specific version I'm thinking in my head. It had the story they were making was, it's a devised performance, but there were a lot of um, ethnic minority characters um, in the production um, just because that was that was what was making sense with the world of what we were doing. But the the racial element of the play wasn't the key thing. It was about, them living in that experience so obviously there is parts of that that she would never be able to understand but at the same time it being a device show these people are making the characters for themselves so they are bringing that and she's bringing the oversight to the narrative and the story of the production which is why i think it turned out so well in the end it's just picking out what elements that you are there to deliver and what takes the whole production to become a fully Mm -hmm. manifested thing and work cohesively 100% yeah I think that's a very good point like that's another 
variable to add into that conversation because it's not as straightforward as people think you know these theaters need to open they need to stay open look at what's happening now you Mm. know and again that conversation of like who's risky like do you know what I mean all that kind of stuff you kind of go what's the industry going to do how are they going to program obviously they've still got to fulfill their previous programming I think but then they also need to guarantee ticket sales. So what does that then mean in terms of representation and what stories are being told? And like you said, who's telling these stories because of the skill set that they have? But then also where's the training going on to those people who will one day be able to tell those stories so that they can tell those stories Mm -hmm. with the skill set required in order to do it in a very successful way? Mm -hmm. Definitely. There's a lot that goes into it. There is. Yeah, those questions, man. (laughs) All right. And the third and final song for this section is Work It by the OG Missy Elliott. Come on. What do you think this is? It's one of two for me. <laughs> okay. It's either, okay, okay. It's either, it could be the theme song. I'm going to mm-hmm. say it's the go-to shower song. Okay. I'm going to be annoyed if I'm zero for free on this interview. <laughs> You're going to have to stay annoyed, bro. Oh, not my. It. It's <laughs> not it. The answer is... This is the song that she could recite for her life. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That makes up for it. So let's let's hear a verse. I can get to know you so I can show you. Put uh-huh. the on ya like I told ya. Give me your number so I can phone ya. Your girl I can stank then call me over. Not on your bed, let me on your sofa. Uh-huh. Come on, you just shake my ooh, ooh. You do uh-huh. know, or you will have won't ya. Like a vulture. I wanted someone to do that question for the longest time. <laughs> oh, I'm so happy I picked that. <laughs> oh, well done. Well done. That was also. Hey, come on. Come on. <laughs> uh, no, big respect to Missy Elliott, man. Big oh. respect to Missy Elliott. Mm. we were speaking about this um, just sort of amongst ourselves myself Ben and um, the other presenter who's normally on the show Aruna Jallo just about sort of the kind of like evolution of the female rapper do you know what I mean and just like the prominence of them in music today in the past how that's evolved and stuff like how do you kind of feel like females are sort of represented more now in the culture today like particularly musically hip hop rap grand that kind of stuff like it's mad as well. It's mad because I feel like, and that's why I love Missy Elliott, you know, because I feel mm-hmm. like she was able to do it in such a way that is so relatable and accessible for so many people. Mm-hmm. You know, she can be, she could be like fire, fire lyrics, you know, creative. You know, she inspired Cardi B with sound effects. Mm-hmm. Like, let's be real, mm-hmm. you know. One of the first rappers actually come in with with content. She can also be sexy with it in terms of mm. her lyrics and even how she may present herself, her image. You know, groundbreaking mm. for so many women in the industry. Mm. Mm. Um, and she's artistically always reaching for the best, and she never mm. settles for anything less. And she has her people who she works with, mm. um, and then that's not even you know, her as a songwriter or her as a producer, you know, her being behind the same, you know, behind the scenes of so many other artists who are, you know, banging records today. Do you know what I mean? And I feel like, you know, she's got an empire. And I feel like with a lot of female rappers, artists today, they're, they're kind of carrying on the one image that I would say was set by like Little Kim. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like it was yeah. just kind of top Little Kim mm-hmm. from my experience. So from what I view, Mm-hmm. And and things are sounding, and that's even in terms of the sound as well and mm-hmm. content. But you kind of go, and I feel like I don't know. It feels very one sided, and that's also why I don't necessarily invest that much into that genre sometimes mm-hmm. because I kind of know what I'm going to get. It's mm-hmm. fun, like you know, what's the name, Mega Miss Stallion? Like it's it's fun, like you know, Savage. Like I can have fun with it, mm-hmm. but. I'm not playing that in the kitchen for my family to hear. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's not mm. the kind of musical education that I want to share mm. personally. Because think- also it's a time. Like, that music's only going to last for now. 
Mm. Where's the longevity? And again, Missy Elliott has that. You could play a super duper fly now and it's still still banned. That's exactly still what banned. I was about to say. I think that she's she's an artist that we can look back on years to come as well, not just now, years to come, and say that she was a timeless artist. Like the thing she was doing, and I'm and you're right, like it wasn't just lyrically beat production wise, it was like the artistry. Like there are some videos here that she's put out that you could watch ten years later and still be like, that's a banging video. Do you know what I mean? That music make me lose control video is still gonna be a banger now. Like, but see, yeah. I wonder what those type of artists are for today. Because obviously, you can't tell someone's gonna be a prodigy in the moment. Like, mm, when true. it's forty years from now, what songs are we listening to that have been released in the last ten years that are gonna be, oi, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, when your parents were just doing gun fingers because they're back in their <laughs> element, like. What are those songs that are being released mm-hmm. now? And I'm trying to think of any artists that could be like, for me, yeah. I know when I hear when I'm hearing some Childish Gambino records, that's going True. off in my kitchen. Yeah, but I can't think of many UK musicians mm-hmm. other than maybe mm-hmm. some some of your Skeptors and your Jamies. But like yeah. you were saying, the content of that is different as well, and the environment of which you can share it in isn't the same whereas the uh, missy elliott tunes they're universal you can listen to them mm-hmm. in, you can listen to them at your wedding uh the after party at a christening in the club like mm-hmm. it's that sense of universality and i don't know if it's a good thing that that universal thing is gone because you there's now the industry's progressed so much so you don't need mm-hmm. to cater to all the audiences to be recognized like there's enough of a subculture and it's active enough for us to for the musicians to make the music they want to make mm-hmm. like that's why you see things like jaw popping up and how afro swing comes along because there's just a general acceptance of the of that culture mm-hmm. whereas i think back in those times like you had to the only way to get the music out there was to put it on radio and if the radio people weren't going to play it then your music your track that basically doesn't mm-hmm. exist so mm-hmm. there was much more of an urgency to make your music quote unquote acceptable and and also there were spaces like the underground music scene. Do you know what I mean? That was bigger those days as well. Like you go to the sound systems, or you know, people will cop those records to pay to play. Mm. Now it's hard to even buy. Not hard to buy records, but do you know what I mean? HMV ain't there. Everything's streamed. Mm-hmm. You go to actually own a copy of. Mm-hmm. You know, I've I've actually got I've got all of Missy Elliott's albums hard copy. Because that was the time. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, I remember my birthday, like, oh my God. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, that mm-hmm. doesn't necessarily exist anymore. Yeah. It's collectible or you have to, you know, have vinyls or whatever it is now. It's kind of like, mm-hmm. so yeah, I think I think you're right. Like, especially nowadays as well. Now it's about pushing for, for the Spotify's, putting, pushing for the iTunes. Mm-hmm. You have to be visible online for people to listen to your music. Mm. the personality Mm. especially the online personality is almost just as important as the physical content itself which i imagine is very jarring to deal with like i can't imagine trying to be a director and have to think my personality has got a smash so the show's gonna smash (laughs) 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 that's wild personally i'm just like and that's why I always look to Debbie Tucker Green, you know. I think she's she's like my role model. I bet she's a boss. Like, there's one picture of her on Google. One. One. <laughs> I love her. You know what I mean? control. <laughs> but also, you know, she's grown up at a different time, you know, or in the industry at a different time. So you didn't need to have that. And so mm. it's finding that balance, you know. I'm not, I'm not always on social media like that. I'm really not. I just don't have mm. the mental capacity for it. But that's why I feel like, I have to be very strategic with the jobs and opportunities that I present myself with so that the right people know me, you know, the right people know my face. Because essentially our industry is it's still word, word of mouth. It still is. Mm. So. You have to be in the building to actually be in the building. Do you know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's very hard to, like, I think back... So my first theatre job job was two years ago when I started working at the court. And before then, I thought, oh, yeah, like opportunities are given left, right and centre. But until you start actually working it, you realise how much that's not the case. It's it, like there are certain things on the surface that are like, oh, OK, cool. You can just be anyone and get those opportunities if you work hard enough. But once you have once you have people inside, you see the amount of opportunities that aren't necessarily front facing. Obviously, you look at all the stage, the people, things that are on stage, like 
cool, yeah, you're directing it, but it's all the little things that are going on behind the scenes. So your R and Ds or your readings or the commissions mm-hmm. and those little things that happen that aren't public. There's so many opportunities, there's so much money there, but those are things that you need to know the people or the people need to mm-hmm. know you. Hundred percent. Mm-hmm. All right then. This is the part of the show where we discuss our last song. Obviously, we've got our guests to send us through so many songs. We thought we kind of repaid a favor and send them one of our own. Uh, so the song today that we chose was "Lovers Rock" by Sade. Ah, oh, Sade. You know, what, yeah, I chose this because I chose the song for this one, and mm-hmm. I'm annoyed because I don't know how. I can't remember how or when, but I only found out about it recently, like within the last month or so, because it's still in my last month's playlist, and. I'm annoyed that I've not heard about it till then, and I'm annoyed no one sent me onto it. So I'm just putting that out there. You lot have done a disservice <laughs> to me. I respect that. I can't lie to you. I, I respect that. <laughs> yeah. we, we should have done better. But no, it's just, again, it's that thing about timelessness. Like, Sade is one of them timeless artists, mm-hmm. not just vocally. But again, like, this, I don't know what it is. There's just something about production with these kind of artists, yeah, that, like, was just so smooth. Like, everything was hand-picked. Do you know what I mean? Like, I feel like it's not the same as today where, like, you get the same 808 pattern and then the same snare and then the same kick and then you get some generic melody and that's your song. And, like, it sounds like five other tracks that you've heard that week. Do you know what I mean? But it's still somehow, like, number one. Like, I don't know. Like, there is something about it. And you're right. Like, it is it is sort of, like, a similar thing when, you know, you, you see the same Macbeths and Chekhovs and da-da-da, like, in the same year. Like, it's just this sort of regurgitated kind of spiel of stuff that, like, you know will sell. And it's tricky. Like, I get it. It's tricky because people got to make money. But, like, I don't know. Especially the way this is going, like, in terms of the music industry. Like, do you think that artistry is ultimately going to suffer over the next 10, 20, 30 years as a result? Or do you think that some way we might see some kind of, like, renaissance period where it sort of flourishes again? Because I hope so. <laughs> I'm hoping for the Renaissance, you know. Mm. And and looking back in history, like whenever there's like an economic crisis, art mm. essentially goes pyong, just spikes because mm. people are vexed, people are angry, people are hungry. Mm. You know, this whole idea called hunger politics, which is like when people are hungry, people are out there protesting, making up noise because they're hungry, you know. Mm-hmm. And so because of that, I feel like there will be a real n- I feel like artists will really want to express themselves in their truth. I feel mm-hmm. like, I hope so. I'm hoping for a renaissance because I do feel like the last few years, things have kind of just been the same, the same, mm-hmm. the same. And that's why I don't really listen to, only if, unless I'm listening to a radio station or a set mm-hmm. that I hear, oh, oh, okay, that's the tune at the moment. Some are like, some not so much. Mm-hmm. And that's also why I always go back to music that I know and artists that I respect because... Mm-hmm. Like with even with Sade, man, the way they would put together an album, do you know what I mean? Like the mm. journey of an album. And there's only there's not that many artists that really think about it. Like as much as I, I respect DJ Khaled, every <laughs> DJ Khaled, no, DJ I'm Khaled. Not on it. This guy doesn't make music, he just puts his name on stuff. <laughs> oh, he, he fully, fully. He picks a sample, chops it up slightly, and that's the tune. <laughs> Like, where's the journey? Do you know what I mean? Because you get to five tracks, you're like, oh, I'm done. I can't, mm-hmm. I can't take too much. Like, mm-hmm. where's the journey? And again, same with theatre, same with plays. Mm-hmm. Where's the journey? Where are you mm-hmm. taking me? Where am I feeling? Where am I stopping? Where am I like, is it? Is that finished? Mm-hmm. Rock mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Amy Winehouse, mm-hmm. you play you play back to black album done. You're like, what? Mm-hmm. I, I was just, I was gearing up. Do you know what I'm saying? And mm-hmm. and it's interesting because, yeah, I feel like a lot of American artists still hold on to that. British artists, mm-hmm. I'm not sure, because I feel like it's a, you know, comp- you know, competitive kind of space. Mm-hmm. But then I do know of music producers who hang on to those artistic elements yeah. and create mm-hmm. journeys within their their EPs. And I feel like I'm hoping there'll be a resurgence of or us hearing those kind of things a lot more. Yeah. I think, because authentic- need, I think authenticity is something that's changing because bio in a way I kind of think it's a good thing because um not authenticity changing just how music has changed because I think although we're losing and we're very nostalgic for those old R&B sounds where you know you, you're I'm trying to think of your ushers and like mm. 
people like that where you're like these are just consistent your John Legend albums like mm-hmm. you're nostalgic for those sounds these albums that tell these stories and XYZ but I think now music has progressed to a stage where music is so accessible to be made by everyone and that's why you see a lot more sub genres popping up and definitely more so in hip hop but I've not seen mm-hmm. as many sub genres pop up for R&B mm-hmm. I don't know why that is but it's just because this is like this manolith thing like you get your new kind of R&B like Tory Lanes, but I don't listen to Tory Lanes. Like, yeah. There's that kind of mm-hmm. format, and then you get rappers that are making quote unquote gal tunes, and like, mm. but there's not, I can't think of many artists today that are making R&B, and I don't know if that's maybe because it's being branded or something else. If it's very easy to chuck R&B records just into a pop category. Mm-hmm. Or even soul okay. as well, like sometimes it rears mm. into the soul element because then it thinks mm. i feel like neo soul as a sound is still moving and evolving but like you said it's taken on different forms it's 100%. kind of like hip hop now or mm. s but it's still soul mm-hmm. and r&b man pff, i feel like it's hard to crack because i feel like you're right i think it is moving towards pop because usher brings up an uh, you know an up-to-date <laughs> r&b tune neo does it it's pop mm-hmm. you know and you go yeah. well is is it Who's it catering for? Mm -hmm. Because really, like, you know, Mary J. Blige, like, you know, R&B, but the sound is, it is evolving and it's losing Mm. what, what it was or what it gave us. Yeah. You know? I think, I think with that as well, like, particularly with male R&B, I think that what sort of began to happen, particularly over the course of like the early noughties, like, and then like 2010s onwards, is that it kind of began to merge a lot with, Hip hop, in a sense that a lot of male hip hop artists started to sing, and a lot of R and B singers started to rap, and it became this weird sort of like cross fusion where you got people like your Tory Laneses and to some extent the Weekend, but even he sort of veered more definitely into pop, and then is kind of using different elements of other musical stuff to kind of sort of bolster that. But like, yeah, you got like your Tory Lanez people like them that are kind of like. Like right. they they rap they rap but like they can they can put a little bit auto tune on and sound like they can kind of sing do you know what I mean and at the same time I kind of respect it though because like the old format was you, cool you got your two verses and the chorus of R and B and then you get yeah. a rapper on to feature and they'll have the rap yeah, verse yeah, in the, and then that be it and then yeah, people yeah, yeah. have looked at it and been like well I'll just, I'll just do it myself mm. <laughs> I'm just gonna run it all myself and fair play to them you know secure mm. the bag uh, it just it's interesting how that changes with the genre and it's exciting to see how that's gonna push forward or mm-hmm. whether it might just stay the same or just stop completely r and mm-hmm. might just become a nostalgic thing altogether mm-hmm. I was going to say another genre that is really close to my heart like you know bashment, reggae, dancehall mm-hmm. and how I'm, I'm going to say it, a lot of Americans taking the mick man like, <laughs> <laughs> you, know, like ah. you know a lot of you know pop is mm-hmm. sounding like Bashman, mm-hmm. dance hall, mm-hmm. and you go, rah. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You know, and they, and they started off by, oh, let's have Mavado on a track. Let's have mm-hmm. this one on a track. But like, how do, and, and, and thinking about it, like Kendrick Lamar, Black of the Berry, you had Agent Sasko, Assassin on, mm-hmm. on his track, but that was so authentically hip hop. Do you know what I mean? It was mm-hmm. such a hip hop vibe. Mm-hmm. But you just put this yard man on and you're like, ah, madness, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know? And it's like, that's when you go, this is paying homage. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When you're not just stealing it. Never forget hearing Justin Bieber's Sorry. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> I can't lie, that was the beginning of the end, you know what I mean? That the was beginning, kind of the beginning of the end. <laughs> and a lot of dancehall <laughs> artists are vexed, you know? A lot of dancehall artists are vexed, they're like, you know, sometimes they're even getting featured on their tracks or they're using their rhythms and all these kind of things and they're not they're not even getting the credit, you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? And you go, rah, like, this is mad, you know? Mm-hmm. I, I don't know, yeah. <sighs> this is something just close to my heart. No, I, I feel you. I feel you. I thought this is the exact same thing when Sorry came out. <laughs> I thought the exact same thing. Because I work with children when I'm not acting and, and I remember, like, doing this, like, being in this dance hall thing and then, this came on, everyone's like, yeah! And I was like, looking around like, no, <laughs> this can't be happening right now. Justin Bieber. Baby Justin Bieber. Do you know? 
Yeah. Is what, that, I don't know. This is the thing, pop music, like, it's, it's, it's the gift and the curse of our culture being brought more and more to the forefront, obviously through our own efforts. Do you know what I mean? To be able to celebrate ourselves more openly is that at the same time, people are going to start to co-op the sound and you get more and more tracks like this. It's, it's a dangerous thing. This is the thing. I feel like pop needs to be split into two things because pop. you've got pop, which is popular music. So you might have mm. things from different genres that is popular and therefore mm. popular music. And then you've got pop music, which are your yeah, Katy Perry's and your Justin Bieber's mm. and them, even your yeah, Ed Sheeran's in certain circumstances. And like, that's a, that's a specific sound. Mm-hmm. So that when Stormzy is making a song and it's pop music, it's not pop music because it sounds like Katy Perry. Mm-hmm. It's pop music because it's popular. Mm-hmm. I think they need to be split somehow into two different things because that pop sound is not the same as popular music. Mm-hmm. Sure. No, hundred percent. I don't know who's oh, gonna do that job though. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> this is not me. Uh, well, Jade. Thank you so much, Jade. Yeah. We love having you on. Man. Thank you for having me. It was good fun, good good chat. Lots yeah, lots man. of that music, man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Hopefully I'm gonna see more Instagram stories of you dancing in your kitchen while cooking to some yeah. big tunes. Yeah, I've got a couple lined up that I need to do still. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to decorate at the moment, so you know what it's like. You know, you'll see like drawers in the kitchen. They shouldn't be. Mm, do you know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind of sort out. Yeah, simmer down a little bit, and then I've got some more coming. Lovely, well, thank you very much, and you. we shall we'll see you soon. Definitely, take care. Everyone. Have a lovely Sunday. Bye. I can't change my energy. Can't fake it. When I'm with you, I feel I can fly. Yeah, fly. Yeah, fly, yeah, fly, yeah. And if this goes and we fall into a stasis, not rugby, you won't yeah. tackle my yeah. pride. Fat pride, white pride, white pride, white pride, white pride.